Greetings. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We come together as God's people to worship and adore our Lord and Saviour, our triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let us hear God's word to bring us into his presence from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 uh, 1 to 7. Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called (coughs) Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even for ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. John. Would you lead us to the throne of grace and ask for the Lord's blessing upon our time together today. Our Father in heaven, as we come to your word and Lord come to worship you this morning, I thank you for setting this time aside that we can meet together corporately, that Lord we can glorify your name in this place. I pray that we would hear from you this morning. I pray for all the gatherings around the country this morning. I pray that they would be guided by your spirit, that they would, O oh Lord, be truth and nourishment to your people. I pray, O oh Lord, that your word would be central and that our Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified. Lord, I pray now that you would settle our hearts and our minds, that we'd be ready to receive what you have for us this morning. In your word, I pray that we would give of ourselves also, that we would offer up our praise and our worship to you. I pray it would be acceptable. I pray, O Lord, that our Lord be glorified in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Notices, God willing, um, later on today, uh, there's an invitation extended to us all. Um, from Dominic Stockford at Christ Church in Teddington. We have an opportunity to meet with uh, the minister, a director of minister of the EFCC, uh, one of the groupings that we're potentially looking to uh, come alongside, uh, Tom Brand. And that's from 5.30. It's an informal time to talk, to hear of him and hear of where EFCC is directed, where they believe the Lord is leading them. Again, please, if you can attend, that would be wonderful. And then at 6.30 at Christ Church, Tom Brand will also be leading their evening service. A very warm welcome from Dominic to all those that can attend. On Thursday, we meet for our third session of the Doctrines of Grace in John. And Thursday's topic is part two of radical depravity. That's how humanity, how it now is after the fall of Adam 
and gives us an insight as to why Jesus Christ came into this world to die for the sins of his people. Eight o'clock on Thursday, all welcome. Next Lord's Day at 11 o'clock. Also, please, again, remember to pray for these times. Today we'll be attempting to look at the miracle of the virgin birth. And this is, today is going to be a whirlwind through the scriptures. You don't need to follow or turn to the scriptures. You may not have time to do that. But again, we're going to be looking at the miracle of the virgin birth. And next Lord's Day, God willing, we'll be looking and thinking about the incarnation, the wonder of the virgin birth. And then on Christmas Day, we intend to meet together for a brief time from 10 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock. 10 to 11. <laughs> and some of us know the in-joke there. But 10 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock we meet for one hour and we pray for the Lord's blessing as we remember or the, the day that we choose to remember the birth of Jesus Christ. Please pray for these. We often have people that do not normally attend uh, any church service and pray that the gospel would go out clearly and that the Lord would be pleased to save sinners. Let us start or continue our service with O Come All Ye Faithful, hymn number 209. As we've already stated, um, this run-up to what we know and call Christmas is not the time that Jesus Christ was actually born into this world. It is not a commanded celebration in the scriptures. And yet it is an opportunity for us to particularly focus our minds on the wonder of the incarnation. The wonder of the eternal son of God coming from the glories of heaven. From all of the majesty and the worship of the angels. The, the worship of his people surrounding the throne. Coming into this world, a fallen world. It truly is a miracle. We were having a chat in the car and uh, there's been a number of dates and, and times of the year that Christ supposedly was born. The fact is we don't have the exact date. We believe it to be sometime in September, but he came. What we read in the scriptures is true and we rejoice. Today I want to continue. We've got a three-part series, as it were, the sign of the virgin birth that we looked at last week from Isaiah 7.14. And today the miracle of that virgin birth the miracle of the virgin birth. Again, it's going to be quite different from the way I normally structure and, and move through the text. In fact, we're not landing in one particular text. We're going to be going all through the scriptures, um, a verse here, a verse there. And as you know, that's not my favourite style of doing things. But I pray that we will be blessed as we hear God's word and how it relates to Christ's incarnation. If you'd like to turn into your Bibles, and if we turn to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and we shall read from verses 27 to 39. Thank you, Richard. Just as a reason why um, you're not finding Bibles where you normally find them. We had uh, Amy and her children came along on Tuesday. And you can see the, the remaining part of the Tower of Bible. And little Elias decided that he would very kindly collect all of the Bibles together and make not a Tower of Babel but a Tower of Bibles and so I do apologise that we haven't rectified that, but he did have a good time. Let us read together another miracle in one sense, God's word 
to humans, God's word to us. Luke chapter 1, verses 27 to 39. In fact, I'll go back, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that are highly favoured, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. This is God's holy word to us this day. Let us join and sing our second hymn. 210, Once in Royal David City. Verse 4 of that. Carol, that hymn, always touches me. I noticed that in verse 3 that uh, both Charlotte and myself were looking down at Sophia when we say that uh, our children should honour and obey their parents. And that Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good as he. But this isn't referring just to age. We are each... God's children in Christ Jesus. And so that isn't just a calling to Sophia and Caris. Not just to you, but to all of us. But verse 4, for he is our childhood's pattern. Day by day like us he grew. That blows my mind every time I sing it. The eternal God, the eternal son of God, growing. Increasing in wisdom and knowledge. It it astounds me. He was little, weak and helpless. In his humanity, I think that we can understand exactly uh, what the hymn writer was intending to say here. Helpless in the eyes of the world. In the eyes of a world that doesn't believe in a God who orchestrates and controls all things, even the safety of his own people. Helpless in the sense as we are, that we are at the mercy of God. Tears and smiles like us he knew, and he feeleth for our sadness and he shareth in our gladness. A God that is ever so close one that not only we can relate to but one that can relate back to us as well what a saviour let's come to the Lord in prayer
Let's ask that he would bless the message to our hearts. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this day, some with sadness upon our hearts, some with gladness, some, Lord, just not knowing where to turn. But we rejoice in our Saviour. We rejoice in such a Saviour as Jesus Christ, who came into this world to save his people from the condemnation of their own sin, the condemnation of their rebellion against a holy and almighty God. A Saviour that came into this world to live a perfect life and to suffer on behalf of his people. Lord, now as we come and we hear your word, we ask that you would set that word in our hearts, that that word may be hidden in our hearts, Lord, that we might not sin against thee. We pray, Lord, that as people ask us about this season, about Christmas, that perhaps something that we hear today would be of use in their lives. That by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would bring back to our remembrance everything and all things that would enable us to be those witnesses, those ambassadors of Jesus Christ that we are called to be. Father, we ask that you would meet with each one of us this day. By your Holy Spirit, through your word, Lord. Strengthen our faith. Increase our amazement. Increase our wonder. Increase our worship of the eternal Son of God. Our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, this day we pray. For we ask it for the blessing of us, his people, his body. And ultimately to the glory of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We've looked at the sign of the virgin birth. And now we move into the miracle of the virgin birth. Really, all of these messages overlap. But hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at the beauty of the incarnation just from slightly different angles, which will increase our wonder and our amazement of who this person is, Jesus Christ. Today we come to the miracle of the virgin birth. I put it under... Uh, Two main headings, and then there's three subheadings under the second one. I don't normally tell you my structure, do I? Because I don't normally have one. But we, we're going to look at the miracle that is prophecy. The prophecy of this virgin birth. And then we'll, we'll be looking at um, uh, the conception itself, the miracle of this conception and then we'll be thinking about what it is for Jesus Christ to be our saviour. That he was to be like us. That he was to be sinless. And that he was to be God. So that's where we're going. As I said, there's going to be many, many scriptures that we're going to refer to. Don't feel as if you have to turn to them. Um, we probably won't catch up. I don't know how it will flow. But keep up. Listen. Hear. Ask God that he might show us the way forward. The miracle of the virgin birth. Prophecy. Many prophets have come into this world. Many have prophesied. Those even outside of the Bible have been claimed to be prophets. But the Bible is unique. The Bible itself proclaims that it itself is a miracle. The triune God has not remained a full mystery. Left to our imaginations about what he might be like. 
or what he requires from his creatures. He has supernaturally spoken and has given to the writers of the Bible his words, his message from humanity for humanity. I would suggest that the greatest prophecy and when we use that term and the way I'm going to be using it later is the things that are said beforehand to let us know about what's going to happen in the future. But prophecy itself is the forth telling of God's word. From cover to cover, this is prophetic material. This is God's voice. As, as we said when we were in 1 Corinthians, you, you want a burning bush like Moses? Well, there it is. Here is where God speaks to us through his word. When Frederick the Great, king of Prussia, asked the court chaplain for an argument that the Bible is an inspired book, he answered, Your Majesty, the Jews... This was his response, and it was well said. To the Jews were committed the oracles of God, Romans 3, 2. These oracles of God, the Holy Scriptures, the law and the prophets, are filled with a large number of predictions relating to their own history. Their unbelief and rejection of the Messiah. The results of that rejection, their dispersion into the corners of the earth so that they would be scattered among the nations. The persecutions and the sorrows that they were to suffer, the curses which were to come upon them, their miraculous preservation as a nation. Even when they didn't have a homeland up until fairly recently, they were identifiable Grouping of people. They were never assimilated. They were never wiped out as much as Satan tried. God had his hand on this people because he had promised that he would keep them. Even in their unbelief, even in their rejection, even as God pours out his correction upon them as a nation, even today, for their rejection of Messiah, their Messiah. He has promised that there is a day coming when they will be restored. But that's another message. That's not where we're going today. All of this was foretold over and over and again. It was announced by their prophets. This is your history, O Israel. Messiah will come. You will reject him. And God is not pleased at this. And he will bless the Gentiles, those who were outside of that covenant relationship with God, those who did not have the oracles of God, that didn't have God's word in their hand. He would bless them through Messiah and cause the Jewish nation to be envious. I feel that the church so often has failed in this task. Again, not where I'm supposed to be going today. The prophecies that are contained in the Bible encourage our faith. They aren't the source of our faith, but they are definitely there to encourage us to put our trust in the God who has spoken, the God who has declared the end from the beginning. The God who knows all things. The God who orchestrates all things after the pleasure of his own will. Because this is the God that we serve. He can speak. He can bring prophetic words forward. Please come in. Feel free. No. Nope. The prophecies that are contained in the Bible are there for our encouragement. The word that we have in our hands today have a supernatural origin. They are not some vague general prophecies, but specific, 
pointed and unrepeatable. Many false prophets have come into this world and many of their prophecies have uh, come to pass. But they're not specific prophecies. They're so vague. It's like those that have gone to mediums and, uh, and are sitting in an auditorium of hundreds and hundreds of people. Is there a person here called John? So vague that you can put no warrant in it. The scriptures are unique and pointed in the prophetic statements that they make. In years gone past, these prophecies contained in the book... They've been seen, the, the pointed nature of these prophetic utterances had been identified and the scholars said, well, they must have been written after the event. They're, they've been slotted into the scriptures because nobody can be this precise. Nobody can foretell the future, their rejection of the supernatural, their re rejection of miracles, the rejection of God leads them to that statement. These so-called Bible critics told us that these were later words added after the fact in order to make it look as if God really had spoken. But after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and further study within this field, this view has nearly automatically disappeared within the scholarly community. The Bible that we hold in our hand, the translation that we hold in our hand, is God's word. Unadulterated, unchanged. The words that we read and the sense of those words in our English language would have been the same that Jesus has read from the scrolls. You see, what we have in this uh, book, this Bible, is 66 books written by over 40 different human authors, and yet there is a, a consistency, a unity that defies any other explanation that this is the very word of God. And through these human authors, there was one supreme, one overarching author, the Holy Spirit of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, we all know, all scripture is given by the inspiration, the outbreathing, the outbreathing of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Peter 1.16 and then 20 and 21. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and, and that moving isn't the kind of moving that we're stirred in our heart as we see a beautiful piece of art or something pops into our mind and it inspires us this moving is is the same term that's used of great ships being blown and the sails catching the wind and being moved carried and this is the same sense here, that the holy men were carried along in the power and the might of the Holy Spirit so that the very words that they wrote are the very words God intended to be written. They are his words. We could talk about Moses and how he speaks and how that's recorded in, in the Old Testament. And then when we come to the New Testament, what Moses said is ascribed to God. Has not God said? Well, actually, no, it was Moses. The, the connection between the written word and God's actual words. Have I made my point? I think so. I hope so. How many prophecies are there in the scriptures? Well, you pick up a commentary, you pick up an encyclopedia... And you'll get various numbers thrown at you. But J. Barton's Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy lists 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament. But I don't want to look at all of them today with you. 
or I think our time would disappear. But just to select few that focus upon the person of Jesus Christ and specifically and especially his birth. You know me. Where will we turn for the very first prophetic utterance for the incarnation? Where do we go? Hmm? Genesis. Thank you. Genesis 3. Any, 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 any other bits? Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity, this is God speaking, and I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, Eve, and between thy seed and her seed, her seed. We, we've spoken about this before. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Seed form, isn't it, really? This, this prophetic utterance. But as the scriptures develop, we'll see the development of this theme. As we went through the overview of the Bible, I think that we saw this building up until we see Christ, the answer of this prophecy in the flesh. He would be born a human, born of a woman. He will reconcile people to God. He will crush evil at his own expense. This is the prophetic nature of Genesis 3.15. doesn't tell us a great deal, but we know what we're to be looking for. He would be a descendant of Abraham. Genesis 22, verse 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. We see this seed coming through. And if you trace through uh, Genesis, that's what you see. You see in the genealogies, the seed that is to come. And it pinpoints to Abraham. He would be a descendant of Abraham's son, Isaac, not Ishmael. Genesis 26, 1 to 5. And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell, of thee, tell thee. Sojourn in this land. And I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all the countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply the stars of heaven and will give unto thee thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. He is to be human. He is to descend from Abraham. And then we get a narrowing down of this. He is to come from Isaac. Abraham, Isaac. And it gets narrowed down even further. He shall be the descendant of Isaac's son Jacob. Genesis 28, 13 and 14. And, before, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Adam and Eve, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He would be a descendant of Jacob's son, Judah. Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter, the ruler, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, Messiah come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. He will be the descendant of Jesse, a descendant of Judah. Isaiah, Isaiah 11, 1. 
And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch that shall grow out of his roots. Verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. We could even think about Ruth, couldn't we? And that kinsman redeemer that produced Obed. And Obed, Jesse, and Jesse, David. (coughs) He's to be of the line and the lineage of David, the king, as we just thought in those passages in Ruth. He would appear after the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So after Nebuchadnezzar had had caused major destructions and the Syrians had completed some of that, he would appear after the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And he would also appear before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. We get this from Daniel 9 verses 25 and 26, that great period of time that God has shown to the day that Messiah would come and would be cut off. But again, we're not here to look at that particular prophecy. In fact, I think Richard would probably give a much better job. Daniel 9, 25 and 26. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks or seven sevens and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. He would appear after the rebuilding of Jerusalem. He would appear before the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. Jews have missed him. Even when it was so clearly prophesied to the day when he would be cut off. He would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah though thou be little among the thousands of Judah yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Genesis 3.15 told us that he was going to be a man. But Micah 5.2 suggests something more than just a man. Whose goings forth have been from of old, even from everlasting. There's only one person that fits that description. God himself. Isaiah foreshadowed the virgin birth of Jesus as we looked last week in Isaiah 7.14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 40 verse 3 and 4. He would be preceded by a forerunner. The very forerunner that we read of in Luke today. John the Baptist. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. This messenger will prepare the way of the Lord, Malachi 3.1. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in behold he shall come saith the Lord of hosts he would appear in Galilee be a light to the Gentiles and from Isaiah 9 1 to 2 that we read earlier Nazareth Galilee And yet, Micah 5.2 says that he'd be born in Bethlehem. God is 
Almighty. He uses even the, the rulers of this world to, to fulfill his purposes. A census was called. And from Nazareth, down Mary and Joseph travelled all the way to Bethlehem, where Christ was appointed to be born. So the first miracle of the virgin birth has to do with the fulfilment of prophecy. And these prophecies were written between 400 to 1500 years before his birth. 400 to 1500 years before they were written down. And these prophecies are even older than that. We come back, go to the very creation of our world. The very fall of Adam and Eve. Somewhat 6,000 years ago. This is God's declaration. That this is my son. In whom I am well pleased. In the person that the Jews and all of the human race have needed since the time of Adam has been prophesied clearly. When the wise Magi came to Herod and they said, where is this king that is to be born? He called the scribes forward and they said, Bethlehem. It was foretold in Micah 5.2. They didn't use the chapter and verses because they didn't exist. But that's where they referred to. The second area that I'd like to think about is the miracle of the conception of Jesus Christ. It is agreed that the conception of Jesus Christ in the Virgin Mary's womb is a miracle. Virgins just don't have babies. But not only because of the miraculous nature of his conception, but also because here in the womb of Mary is a sinless Saviour, fully God and fully man. I don't know if any of you saw the, um, the quote that I put up in the Bible study group. This truly amazed me. In the words of A.B. Bruce, a sinless man is as much a miracle in the moral world as a virgin birth is a miracle in the physical world. Here is the miraculous here is Christ. But for Jesus to be a saviour to mankind, he was to be like unto us. Genesis 3.15, he's to be a man. Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under, law, under the law. Why? Why was it necessary for Christ, the eternal Son of God, to be in flesh? Well, we could answer in one hand, well, God foretold it. It's prophetic. God doesn't go back on his word. He's truthful. What he says, he does. <coughs> we can go back, I suppose, to Adam, a man, flesh and blood, like us. But in Adam, the scriptures tell us, all sinned. Through the second Adam, Christ, also truly man, we can be saved. The original offence of sin came into this world through man. And therefore it was man that was to pay for that offence. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength, when we couldn't do it ourselves, when we had no power in ourselves, in due time, the appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 8 to 10. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, 
much more being reconciled, we shall be saved through or by his life. Romans 5, 12, 19, it continues. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, Moses, even over them that had sinned, not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Christ, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned. He wasn't a sinner. So is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one judgment came upon all, upon all men, to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. For Christ to be able to pay for our sins, he too needed to be a man. For sin entered into this world through mankind, and so the justice of God demands that the payment for these crimes also came from men. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament was declared to be faulty. It could never take away the sins of people. It was just a picture, a signpost to the one who truly would. The blood of goats and bulls and lambs didn't take the sins of the people away. And this was shown by its repetition, daily, yearly. Repeated again and again and again. crime of sin came into this world through man and its satisfaction would also come through a man. And yet God is not man. God is spirit. And I'm sure Charlotte could give us the the, the shorter catechism of this. What is God? God is spirit, infinite, and so on and so on. It means that he doesn't have a body means that he doesn't have flesh and blood. It means that he cannot die. It means that he cannot bleed. And as Leviticus 17.11 and Hebrews 9.22 clearly state, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So this leaves us in a dilemma. Blood needs to be shed. Animals just don't cut the mustard. They, they can't get rid of that sin. The offence came in by a man. And so therefore, the judgment also needs to fall upon a man. Therefore, God assumes a real humanity. He didn't just come into this world appearing as if he was a man. He was truly man. Flesh and blood, like you, like me. He came in the person of the Son, the eternal Son, into this world and joined a human nature to his divine nature. Not mingled, not changed, but joined indivisibly. Without mixture. And this was accomplished in the Virgin Mary. Man. From humanity. 
who conceived Jesus. And this process was overseen and guided by the Holy Spirit. But not only was it imperative that Jesus was to be born a true man, he also needed to be sinless. For Jesus to be a saviour to mankind, he was to be sinless. A sinner could not pay for other people's sins. Someone who's bankrupt cannot pay for somebody else's bills. They don't have the wherewithal. They don't have the resources. A sinner cannot pay for the sins of another. For they would have to pay for their own sin. For the crimes against a good and holy God. Sin calls forth judgment and justice. Just as um, Cain and Abel, when God says, his blood cries out to me. The earth itself is calling out for justice. Sin demands justice because it is against a holy God. If Jesus had been a sinner, he could not avoid the justice of God and the punishment of his sin, which is eternal death. And therefore, he would be unable to pay for our sin. He could not make the payment that God demanded, perfection, without spot, without blemish, without defect, if Christ himself had been a sinner. He could not fulfill the role of the saviour of the world if he was tainted with sin. So he needed to be man and he needed to be sinless. Christ had to be sinless in order to be able to pay for the sins of others. The predicament is that every single human since Adam has not only been born into sin through the original fall, but has confirmed Adam's rebellion by his or her own rebellion against God. The Bible declares there is no no righteous, no not one. They have all gone their own way. There is none that seek God. Therefore the whole human race is born into sin, bound by sin and under God's righteous judgment. Deserving of death, eternal death. This is the conundrum. How can the human race be rescued out of rebellion and avoid the inevitable condemnation when without exception everyone is inescapably a part of it? Who can deliver the human race? He has to be human. He has to be sinless. And yet since the entire human race is ineligible to bring the redemption, this rescue... God knew that the only solution was if he himself became a man and entered into the human race as the new Adam, or a second Adam. And in the most amazing act of condescension and mercy, God became a man. But one untainted by all human sin, Christ, the eternal Son of God, was thereby born into the human race Through the Virgin Mary as the second Adam. But unlike Adam, Jesus chose to obey God. Where Adam failed, where Adam sinned, Christ triumphed. The result of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ is that we now have two Adams. We have two federal heads of two different races. The seed, the seed of Adam, the seed of Satan, the fallen seed, the corrupt seed. 
And then we have the seed of the woman. Christ. You are either in the first Adam or the second Adam. There is no neutral ground here. One of two parents, as it were. One of two representatives. The first Adam, who is the head of a race under condemnation. And the second Adam, who is the head of a new redeemed humanity. And if we trust in Christ, then we become a part of his obedience. In the same way that we had formerly been a part of Adam's first rebellion. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, The first man, Adam, became a living being. And I think you could put in brackets there, a dying being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Christ alone lived a holy life without sin. Therefore, Jesus' death was offered up as a substitution for us. Jesus bore the penalty of our sins upon the cross of Calvary because he himself could. Because he himself was sinless. The cross is an astonishing expression of God's love, his chesed, his grace and mercy, as well as God's holiness and justice. And it's all expressed simultaneously in the full perfection of God's holiness. God's holiness and justice requires that sin be paid for in full. Sin cannot be ignored or swept under the carpet. Satisfaction must be made. God's righteous judgment was poured on Jesus Christ, poured out upon Jesus Christ, his beloved son who bore the sins of the world. Yet that very act of judgment was also the greatest expression of God's love for us. It was God's grace and mercy that sent his only son, his only begotten, as a substitution for us. The father sent and the son willingly came to pay the debt that we owed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here in Christ we see God's love for us. Christ's determination for us. Here is that great transaction whereby Christ took all of our sin. And through pure grace gave us an alien righteousness. A righteousness that is not of our own. Not only did Christ need to be human. Not only must he be sinless. A sinless human. There was also another requirement that the miracle of the virgin birth enabled. For Jesus to be saviour to mankind, he was to be God. John 1.1 1, 1 and, um, and 14 declare this is who he is. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is who Jesus Christ is, not only man in the flesh, but God, the eternal Son. 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus is both man and God. Jesus lived the sinless life that we could never live. And as such, he is the only one who could die a substitutionary death for a sinner. But sin against an infinite God, this is an argument that Anselm brought forward. He used it as the totality, which fails on many levels. But I think you'll see the sense in this as well. But sin against an infinite God is an infinite crime. 
and therefore requires infinite satisfaction. Do you follow that? Sin against an infinite God is an infinite crime and therefore requires infinite satisfaction. Therefore, either man, who is finite, must pay the penalty for an infinite length of time in hell, or the infinite Christ must pay for it once. Jesus went to the cross to pay the debt we owe to God for our sin. To stand in our place. To face our judgment. And to make an atonement. To make a cleansing of that sin. Through his blood. And those who are covered by his sacrifice. Will inherit the kingdom of God as sons of the king. John 1.12 Jesus Christ the God. The God man who entered into our world, was perfectly suited to be the saviour of a fallen human race. As a man, he was able to identify himself with men before God. And as God, he was able to make an infinite satisfaction for the sins of his people. If he had been merely man, his atonement could have had only finite value. Had he been merely God, he, he, he could not have been tempted, nor could he have died to make that satisfaction. But in his two natures, united, he was able to perform the duties binding on men while possessing the prerequisites which belong only to divinity. And that comes from Gerstner. That's not my words. Here in the virgin conception and birth of Christ, We see God's wisdom. For he made a way that we could not demand of him. Well, you put us in this position, God. You created Adam and Eve. You you must do something about it. Who are you, O man, to tell God what to do? The creature to the creator. We could not demand God free us from the penalty of Adam's sin, nor of our own. But he always planned to do such. In his immense chesed, his love, his mercy, his loving kindness. It was always his plan to save a people, to give them to his son, to bring glory to his name. And it's all of grace. If he'd been merely man, his atonement could have only had finite value. Had he been merely God, he could not have been tempted, nor could he have died to make satisfaction. In this virgin conception and birth of Christ, we see God's wisdom. We have the perfect God, the perfect man, sinless and glorious. In Christ we have the birth of the saviour of the world. In Christ we have our saviour. The only saviour. To reject him is to sin. To reject him is to add to that long list of sins. To reject him is infinitely worthy of judgment. The virgin birth of Christ is indeed a miracle. It defies our explanation. It goes against all that mankind has ever achieved. But rather than cause in the children of God scorn and scepticism, this miracle calls forth an opportunity to believe and for another miracle to take place. That of regeneration. Being born again. Born into a new life, a new way of life, a new order of life. This is miraculous that God saves his enemies. That God saves sinners who are are repulsive to his being. The soul that sinneth it shall die. 
But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes, you can't do that. And do that which is lawful and right, you can't do that. He shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. There is none righteous, no, not one. Have I any pleasure at that at all, that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Praise God that he did not take pleasure in all of his creation to perish in their sins. But he sent his son through the miracle of the virgin birth to redeem sinners. To redeem his people, to redeem us, I pray. What do these miracles call forth in your spirit today? Do they draw you to worship? Do they draw you to the wonder and love of this triune God? This triune God who is planned and orchestrated from the beginning of time, in fact, before the beginning of time, your salvation. What do these miracles call forth in your spirit? What does this great salvation for his people mean to you personally? What does it mean to you that the Son of God came into this world in order to bear the sins of his people? What does this mean to you today? What will your rejection of these miracles of the Saviour, Saviour's birth, what will the rejection of this wonderful Saviour bring to you? Will you turn from your unbelief and call out to him? Will you repent and turn from your sin and cling to him alone for your righteousness? Or will you continue in your rebellion against this holy God, this infinite, holy God? Will you continue to, to reject the only means of your salvation from his wrath? Will you turn and live? Will you acknowledge the great love that God has shown towards a fallen and sinful world by sending his son into that sinful world to die on behalf of his people? To reconcile. To give light. To bring life. What is your answer? Where are you today? In Adam? Or in the miraculous Christ? Richard, would you close our time in prayer? <coughs> Dear Lord and Saviour, bless thee and praise thee for thy great love and sacrifice and obedience through which we have salvation. Purchased by thee at Calvary. We praise thee and bless thee that though we are weak sinners, it has pleased thee to love us from before the foundation of the world we should be called and chosen and saved unto everlasting life. Through your life and death we have life. We thank thee for thy grace and mercy. We thank thee for the gift of faith without which we could not believe or serve thee. We ask for thy strengthening in our commitment and purpose to do that which is pleasing in thy sight, those things that thou hast purposed that we should do, and that we should ever turn to thy word and to thee to know those things 
that are acceptable and true and worthy of all acceptation. And ask for thy blessing as we leave this place and also to strengthen us and call to witness to, to thee as ambassadors. Thou art the only way for men to be saved. No man can come to the Father but by thee. Give us that strength and encouragement, Lord, and wisdom and understanding. And in Jesus' name, Almighty Father, we praise, honour, glorify and thank Thee and exhort our Saviour mm. above all. Amen. Amen. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. Amen.